For this lecture, we're gonna focus on performance measures that are specific to our field, medical imaging and radiation therapy. The work that we do substantially contributes to positive patient outcomes, but I want you to ponder two specific questions. How do you feel that other medical professionals perceive our roles? So that being nurses, physicians, um, laboratory technicians, respiratory therapists, kind of you name the game medical professionals and I want you to think about how they perceive our role in comparison to their role. Um, I think everyone kind of has the um, perspective that their role is the most important and we really need to kind of get over that perception and come together more as a team, focusing not on our specific discipline, but focusing on how we can better improve patient care. So as far as the patients then go, how do you feel that they rank our values? So the value that we provide, whether that be in terms of radiation therapy treatments being delivered, or medical imaging procedures being conducted, whether that be a nuclear medicine scan, whether that be an MRI, whether that be a CT or projection or radiograph. Um, what, what do you perceive, the, how do you perceive our patients kind of taking away that information? Is it valuable to, to them? Are we just another step um, in their road to recovery or to their road to discovery of you know, what the underlying causes are? Um, or are patients looking at us as being valuable providers um, independently? So some, some definite questions to start to think about and, and consider because when we think about what we do, we know it's important, but it's important for patients to understand the, the value of it as well because like any department, with the care that we provide and deliver is being evaluated by those patients. Traditionally speaking, the measures that we conducted um, were really indirectly related to care rather than directly related to kind of that um, patient perspective of that care. So how was our, our equipment performing? Was the quality control um, tests that were you know, done you know, monthly, annually, were they, were they um, checking out as, as being acceptable? Um, were the patient wait times and radiation doses being monitored and controlled? Um, what was the, our image quality like, like? Like, What was our treatment responses like for those patients? Um, those were the types of traditional measures that, that were made. So you can see that it's very, I'm going to say unilateral, in that, that they're really focused on, on us, with the exception, I, I think, of um, treatment responses from, the, from an outcome-based perspective is, um, it's, it's really focused on how we're performing rather than what the patient perceives or what the patient wants. So this now brings us to the modern perspective where it's not necessarily about how we're performing in our department, it's about how the patient is perceiving how we're performing in our department. So it's a very different focus and that information is going to be derived from patient satisfaction surveys. The patient's concept of care can very much differ from our perspective of the care that we're delivering. So these satisfaction surveys really act as a set of checks and balances. We can think that we're delivering 100% guaranteed satisfaction, but that may not be what the patient perceives. They may say that, that the staff is grumpy, that they're not providing the information that they need, the information that they're pro providing is not understandable. The environment is is dirty. They weren't protecting my my privacy. Um, you know, I was provided there was only you know one gown and it was super extra large, and I had to wait in that waiting room for 45 minutes and it was cold. You know, those types of things um, are what's important. So we have to think about you know how accommodating we are we're being in our approaches. How are we delivering that information? Is it at a level that the patient is actually un going to understand? Are we readily asking the patient if they have questions, prying them to, you know, to be able to say, this is my, my concern, that way we can accommodate them. Um, is the environment that we're putting them in, is it clean? Um, nosocomial infections is one of the biggest problems in healthcare. Um, and that's not just because it's vis visibly dirty, dirty. It's, you know, it's, it's that there is actual, you know, the patient comes in and they may be healthy and then they're leaving with a um, disease that they hadn't, that they didn't come in with. So those types of factors are all very, very important. 
So the end all is that the model of healthcare is changing. We can no longer push away patient questions. Patients want to be at the center of that decision making. So they're involved in that patient centered approach. So all levels of providers need to be as responsive to the patient's needs as possible. Specifically at the physician um, patient level, the shared decision making process is becoming a very, very important component. Patients are not passive recipients of healthcare. They're knowledgeable clients with the capacity to choose. They have an independent voice. When we think about the traditional delivery model, essentially the patient acted um, in accordance to the physician's um, will. Um, they said, get this test. The patient says, okay, I'm gonna go get this test. Um, that's no longer the case. There's too much information that, that's out there. Patients are becoming um, very, very savvy, and we need to be responsive um, to their needs. Specifically, the patients have a lot of choice. If they have a bad experience at one healthcare facility, they can easily go down the road and um, get their care from another facility. Not only are you going to lose that patient, but now that patient is talking and that word of mouth is going to spread. Consumers are you know, knowledgeable, but they, they still, the word of mouth is a powerful, is a powerful tool. So we have to be able to make sure that we're satisfying our customers to help them come back. That's going to increase the profitability of our department, of our facility. It's going to improve the market share. Um, and that's ultimately how that health system runs is, you know, if, if we want to not have all of our resources stretch so far, we have to satisfy our customers. We have to bring them back. The more patients that we can re return, the better um, profitable, more profitable our um, particular department and facility will be. Now, when we're talking about care, I don't want you to think of it truly just from the business perspective. What we do is incredibly important. Um, patient, patients are coming to us in um, unhealthy states, unsure states. Um, th there's a lot of ramifications, so we have to think about caring as far as um, communicating, reassuring, advising, assisting in any way that's possible. But the demands that are in place really cause us to have to balance the quality versus the quantity. We may want to provide the best type of care possible, but because of the demands or because of staffing levels, we may not be able to dedicate as much time to that patient as we need. So, you know, how can we give the patient the best possible care in the least amount of time is essentially the, the, the question at hand. I don't think necessarily it's a good question. I, I think, you know, the, the better quality of care that we can provide, um, the, ultimately the better the satisfaction but that really wreaks havoc on um, numerical throughput. So we have to think about controlling um, factors that are restrictive to the, to the patient. So achieving better patient wait times. Um, if we can kind of move patients through in a quicker manner, they're gonna be more satisfied, but we're also going to help to meet our profitability targets. So um, wait time is one variable that very much needs to be controlled, um, but Budgetary restrictions are in place, um, largely because of um, reimbursement models um, being um, lessened. So we, we have less money to do um, essentially more work, So, but we have um, less staffing that, that's going to be available because we can't afford them because we're not getting as much money in return. So. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of balancing that, that's take pla taking place. And then when you consider the time restraints of how long it takes to provide quality of care, um, how long it takes to um, actually monitor um, monitor the care that we're, we're actually um, delivering as well also takes time. So uh, certainly a ton of um, things to think about here with quality and quantity, throughput, budget, and time. Um, and how we can still remain patient-centered and patient-focused throughout all of this. So if word of mouth doesn't make its way to the patient, additionally then, all of the information that you know we're tracking and whether we have time for or not, don't have time for, we still have to report. And we have to report it to maintain our accreditations and accreditation is required to achieve our reimbursements. 
And, you know, all of this information is available for the public. You know, we don't have paper that goes into the steel, the steel bin that's only retrievable by upper level administration. This is, you know, soft copy based information that's uploaded to the web, accessible by patients, referrers, so like physicians. Um, and potential funders. So, you know, all of this information is readily available, nice and transparent. So if word of mouth doesn't get you, um, essentially for those uh, savvy um, consumers, you know, they can say, oh, wow, this, this facility is not doing very, very good. I'm going to go ahead and go to the one across town instead. Now, the idea of reporting is not something that's new. And reporting itself isn't designed to you know, get you into trouble. It's really designed to um, allow you to improve, to justify um, what you're doing, to, to really um, say, hey, this, um, this level of quality doesn't compare to um, this level of quality or doesn't compare to the national benchmarks or doesn't compare to um, what's going on in other countries. You know, what, what can we actually do um, to improve? So um, there became a, a focus on population health beginning in the 1800s to really look at um, survival rates um, and um, productivity of treatments. Um, and specifically in the 1950s, Florence Nightingale was credited with um, kind of leading the quality-based initiatives in that uh, her approaches um, really demonstrated, so she would change her approaches and see how they affected survival. So you weren't just getting um, essentially blanketed treatments and saying this is what you get for this condition, but you know we essentially we're looking at now um, you, you got the rates, now what happens if we adjust um, this factor and we'll see what happens to the rates. Um, that essentially initiated the, the, quality, um, the quality factors. Um, 1970s, the World Health Organization, WHO, um, they um, started to look at uh, mortality and morbidity, so um, looking at longevity factors, disease survival rates, um, so lots of really good things. I think it's important to, to look at the, this information. Like I said, it, this shouldn't be, these, this information is not designed to be punitive. It's definitely designed to improve the delivery of healthcare. Um, so I, I think I, it's very, very good that quality indicators are in place. And I think some of that good becomes lost because we, we are forced to satisfy regulators. We are forced to satisfy patients and staff. Um, but, you know, it, it's important to, to really do, do the best we, we possibly can in establishing practice quality improvement projects, which, well, you know, you'll focus more on in um, quality management, IMG 405, if you haven't taken that class. Um, but you can start to think about, you know, what works best for, for conditions, how's the hospital performing, are we being as cost effective in this particular area as possible, what, is, what do the patient wait times actually look like, um, maybe looking at comparisons between modalities between saying uh, for this condition, this modality may be better because of this factor. Um, so, you, you know, essentially the goal of quality indicators is to produce some objective based answers. So typically um, objective um, based answers do come in the numerical form or the quantitative form. Um, but it is important to understand that quality is relative rather than absolute. So it is uh, a comparison. So, you know, it's, it's looking at the, the differences between healthcare in different states, looking at it, the, the differences between, um, you know, neighboring healthcare facilities, looking at it um, from, you know, national, national levels. So, you know, how does the U.S. compare to England or Denmark or Ireland? Um, and looking at it kind of in, in, those, in that perspective. Now the textbook does do a nice job at defining some different terms and I want you to take a look at these different terms. Sometimes we use things interchangeably and we necessarily shouldn't. It's not to say that these definitions are, are perfect, there are other definitions that are out there, but I think it's important to kind of look through some of these definitions. So do spend some time um, looking at the definitions on the next few slides.
So the big takeaway from those definitions and those different domains of care is that what we're expected to do and what patients are evaluating on us on is a very, very complex process and what you know that process looks like um, in reality versus what the patient's expectation is may very much differ. I think this graphic does a really nice job at kind of describing some of those differences. So you can see that the bottom, um, the bottom line down here is reality. So this is all what's happening in reality. And this is what the expectation is. So you can see that at times the, um, you know, the expectations may differ. Now this isn't gonna be the case for every patient, but this is an example of you know, how um, the provider expectations or provider beliefs may be different because we're so close to things than um, what the patient is actually feeling. So you can kind of see a traditional, we'll, we'll call this an inpatient um, process. So the patient enters the hospital, they're admitted, um, and they, they come into an atmosphere that may be, um, you know, a little bit noisy, a little bit confusing, a little bit businesslike, um, rather than um, helpful, reassuring, quiet, and calm. Um, when they start to interact then with with the staff, you know they may not be getting the answers that they that they need, and that may be leading to some fear, some confusion, some perception of oh my gosh, they're not they're not listening to me. Why aren't they answering my questions? Why aren't why aren't I getting the information um, that that I actually need? Um, so you you can kind of see how that can lead to. Um, some confusion, and ultimately, that's what we don't want to produce. So, um, you know, you always have to really, you know, check yourselves to make sure um, that the patient is take getting the takeaway points that's ne that's necessary. So, you know, those teachbacks um, are incredibly important aspects where you know you're you're relying on the patient, you know, having the patient describe, you know, what they what they need or. Um, if you're giving them directions, have them respond in their own kind of terms. I mean, we look at uh, kind of this, this circle-based um, chart here. So it's, it's not just about what we're doing, but it's about the whole process that's being evaluated specifically in um, surveys. So HCAPS-based surveys, um, Prescani surveys, uh, patient satisfaction surveys, whatever you want to look at. So it's, you know, it's how things, are, how things are, are working in the place and being delivered by those people. And then patient satisfaction is just, you know, one, you know, HCAP surveys is just one component. There are several surveys um, that are out there and um, that facilities are scrutinized and um, based off of. So it's, it's, it's definitely, um, healthcare is, is a complex, is a complex system. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of things going on. So you can see, you know, with, um, you know, the results of these surveys and how important these, these surveys are because they really can affect how a department is actually running um, or how a department will run. So say if you're, you're not making your, your numbers, what happens to staff? You know, what happens to purchase requests? What happens to, you know, new equipment that you need? Um, do those things get pushed further back? And if they do get f pushed further back, then what happens when you compare your facility to another facility? And, and you know, patients do the same type of thing. So, you know, it's there's a lot of balancing that that's involved when you start to scrutinize um, departments based on performance, based on satisfaction, based on you know results of different surveys. So all of these factors kind of come together and say, all right, now we have to self-audit ourselves. We have to compare ourselves to local benchmarks, to national indicators. And yes, accreditation processes are, you know, do, do require these, these types of, um, you know, benchmarking comparisons to be done. But it is important to, to self-audit and to recognize that there are several steps of quality. Um, and you should really go through all of the steps with the whole idea of, um, kind of the, those last three bullet points here is that we need to um, raise our standards, increase our own expectations, make sure that we are having safeguards in place um, to improve the patient experience, and making sure that we're consistently staying ahead. Essentially, when you when you break that down, that really is the definition of quality improvement. So it's not just about maintaining performance, but it's a, a focus on continuous um, improvement. Um, a way to kind of um, implement that is the, the PDCA cycle, Plan, Do, Check, Act. Um, it, in quality management, we will talk more about that as well.
And as you're focusing on those quality improvement projects, it's important to look at um, metrics from a variety of different categories. So those being structural process and outcome based. Um, radiology based study um, did determine that majority of um, what we look at um, happens on the structural side of things. So that's, you know, looking at uh, fixed uh, fixed practice such as you know what's going on for equipment making sure that we're doing our quality control making sure we're maintaining our accreditation is a majority of you know the quality based um, functions that we're actually looking at um, with then process and outcomes coming in you know at, in a tie after that but it's really important like I said earlier to start to look at the outcomes so looking at um, essentially how is our care what we're actually doing affecting patient-based outcomes I think that that's a big focus that should be a big focus in research um, and, and it is currently lacking um, not just based on this report but just you know just in general of, of what's actually out there is to really you know focus on um, essentially how the work that we do or the work that our radiologists do or the work that our radiation oncologists do directly relates to improving of those patient outcomes. While quality improvement projects can be very fun, they also can be required aspects through accreditation. Um, so when, in terms of you know, what we're looking at for our external regulatory agencies, you have your hospital-based um, accreditors with the Joint Commission, and then you have your medical imaging and radiation-specific, radiation therapy-specific accreditors with the, the ACR. So the ACR's whole goal is essentially to put out reasonable expectations to help improve or create um, high quality of care being delivered. We've talked about the um, and NRDR, so the National Radiology Data Registry, really important tool um, that helps to create some of those benchmarkings to see where you're at um, to help to uh, kind of facilitate some of those quality improvement clinical audits um, just to make sure that what we're doing is up to par and that um, obviously that information becomes publishable, it becomes available. Um, and if, if we can um, readily maintain our accreditations, obviously we can promote and advertise that as well. So you can see some of those uh, different types of accreditations um, with the ACR. I guess that's, that's probably pretty blurry um, on that particular um, graphic, but MRI, CT, uh, mammography, sonography, um, stereotactic um, based procedures. Um, you, you can look at the, um, the DICO um, as well, so Diagnostic um, Imaging Center of Excellence is, is, is the big one. Um, so, you know, all kinds of different um, accreditations that are out there um, that the ACR offers. Maybe you've been involved with some of those accreditation processes. If you haven't, I encourage you to jump on some of those opportunities. It will definitely be a learning experience for you. Then to get back to that balancing act, so now we have all of these demands from our accreditors and you know accreditation is in, in, in place and we do abide by it largely to make sure that we achieve our reimbursements from third party payers like, um, like CMS to make sure that you know we're getting the money um, because if we don't have money or we don't have an operational budget, uh, but payers are um, seeking to minimize um, costs, but yet still require you know high quality services to be delivered. So uh, it really becomes this this taxing experience, and in terms of you know wh where that that money is actually coming from, it comes from a variety of different er areas, and there are penalties in place if you don't meet some of those areas. So if you haven't looked at some of those. Um, you know, payment-based qualities, I encourage you to do so. You can kind of see on, on this particular graphic um, what some of those areas are looking at. So um, looking at readmission. So, you know, if, if a patient is readmitted within 30 days um, for the, the same diagnosis, you know, penalty can be, it can be in place and you're not going to get all of the, that return revenue. So you have to make sure you're doing the, the best job that you can the first time through. So all of these factors then do in fact, you know, impact how our departments run. 
Uh, they impact the, the staffing level. So in terms of administrative functions, there is a lot um, to balance when, when you think about the demands of accreditation um, because of reimbursements and then focusing on um, you know, patient satisfaction survey results because of reimbursements. They all influence um, what we can and can't do in our departments. Now, just the final little point that I want to point you towards is, you know, another resource that you can acquire information from that may lead to some successful quality improvement projects taking place. So it kind of goes back to making sure that you're staying ahead. And this is a, one of those resources that can help you um, make sure that you're doing that and make sure, you know, they provide evidence and make sure um, that, with the goal of that evidence being used. So. Um, and it's the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. If you haven't checked it out, I encourage you to go to that site. So this concludes our performance measures lecture. I hope you've taken away some key points and understand how patient satisfaction and accreditation tie into reimbursement and subsequently how um, that reimbursement does affect our bottom line and it affects how we can operate in our departments.